Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Easy 11 Plus Live lesson and Dimitri is very excited to be joining us to look at a past paper from Manchester Grammar School. Uh, don't forget that there are loads of useful links in the video description, uh, including lots of free things that you can sign up for. Um, don't forget that channel membership offers you loads of extra videos and other benefits. Um, and uh, yeah, the live chat today is, of course, as usual, for subscribers to the channel. Subscribing is completely free. If you want to join in the live chat, just click subscribe underneath this video and you can join in straight away. And by subscribing, you support me, you support Dimitri. He's very grateful. Um, he's very excited about being an internet star. And um, you also find out about other videos that I post on the channel as soon as they go up and all that kind of thing. Right, let's get started and let's have a look at this paper. Dimitri, do you think we should look at this paper? He says that he's already solved it and so he is not... Oh, yeah, you see he's showing us. He's not particularly interested having solved this paper already. But let's have a look at it. Kunda It's Noel, my shirt is wonderful, elbow cough, elbow cough, elbow cough. I'm so offended. So offended. Okay, so we got, oh, I'm being, I'm being bitten, I'm being bitten on the, look at this, look at this savage beastie. He says, I have done this paper, what are you trying to make me do? All right, all right, all right, fine, you've done the paper, that's fine, I get the message. Um, um, so um, you don't need to look at it. Right, so this paper is, if you can see it on the screen here, oh, and it's frozen, lovely. Hang on a second, I just need to sort this out. Um, technology never ceases to make me happy. Um, back to there, and back to there, and fingers crossed this will now work. Yes, good, it works, fantastic. Okay, and the microphone's working. There were plenty more things that could go wrong, let's put it that way. So, this is from Manchester Grammar School, and it is there, um, yeah, sorry, it's here. 2019 English Section A paper. Now, this is one of my favourite 11 plus papers. I think the papers they set are really interesting, really well, really well thought through, um, very challenging, What's really uh, interesting about these papers, uh, a couple of things. For one thing, um, you've got 30 minutes for 40 marks, so you need to move faster on average than a question a minute, and that can be quite challenging. Although, as you'll see, there are some questions that you can move through rather, from, rather more quickly, saving time for the later ones. And the other thing they do is that they have a range of sections. Uh, so they have a section on use of English, um, which is kind of sort of verbal reasoning and grammar, that kind of thing. They have a comprehension section, which is multiple choice comprehension, really challenging, thought provoking multiple choice comprehension. They also have proper verbal reasoning and data handling, which often means you'll get some kind of chart or table and you have to interpret it and reach multiple choice solutions. Now, what I'm planning to do today, hopefully, is get through this and this, and then I'll come back in a future week and look at the next two sections in another video. So today we're focusing on questions 1 to 20 in this paper, unless we run out of time, in which case I'll cut it short a bit earlier, but we'll see how we go. Um, Sarah Tibble says, I've already done this match to grammar paper. Uh, great. Um, I hope that my way of thinking about it is interesting and that you can find things to agree with and disagree with and that generally this session will help you to understand the paper better. Looking at the instructions, there's some good advice here. Um, write your answers clearly. You'll see why that's an issue as we go through. Um, and then something that's always good advice for an exam like this, if you find that you cannot answer a question straight away, leave it blank and return to it later if you have time. Time is a real issue with this paper, so you have to keep moving. And if a question is too challenging, don't waste several minutes on it. If you don't see the answer fairly quickly, leave it and be ready to come back. Um, right, indeed, as it says, when in, at the end it's better just to guess, or you know, to give your best estimate of an answer than it is to leave something completely blank. Okay, let's get on to actually answering the thing. Um, oh, I'll get rid of the poem in the corner. That's for later on. Um, and you can see my nice channel logo instead. Uh, I'll pull that up when we get to the comprehension section. So this is the use, use of English section. Now, important advice for any exam, but especially for an exam like this that isn't entirely typical, um, you have to read the instructions very, very carefully. Okay, so, um, uh, B.S. France says no creative writing. That comes elsewhere in the assessment process, not in this paper. They actually have another English paper. They also have an assessment day when you might need to do some creative writing. We're just looking at the English paper A, which is the multiple choice paper. Good question. Um, Dolly Liz says Robert is cool. Yeah, despite my shirt. Uh, okay, 
maybe it's the green background it doesn't go with. Let's say it would be very trendy if it was against a kind of, you know, a white background or something, um, something like that. Right. Using the sentences and questions one to five, that's the questions here. A word is hidden at the end of one word and the beginning of the next word. Okay, think about carefully about what that means. It means between one word and the beginning of the next word. But it does not mean inside a word. So, for example, here in the example is the word though. That is not the answer because it is completely within one word. It is not overlapping the end of one word and the beginning of the next word. So make sure you read the instructions carefully. With each question, a clue is given as to the type of word you are looking for. Okay, so for example, the word is a planet and the answer is Earth. So if there's something else, if there's another word somewhere there, but it isn't a planet, that won't be the answer. Okay, and finally, it says when you found the word, write it in the box alongside the question. So you need to make sure you actually, in the example, write down the word Earth and don't just underline it because you won't get the mark for that. So a lot of instructions to follow. You have to read them carefully, even though that also comes off your time. The important thing in an exam where you've got a strict time limit is that you need to move steadily, keep moving through, but never rush. Never skip doing fundamental things like reading the instructions carefully. Okay, now we've read the instructions and we're going to move on through. Loads of people commenting. Fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, anyone else who wants to comment who just joined, uh, the comments are for channel subscribers. Subscribing is completely free. Just click subscribe underneath the video window on YouTube and then you can join in with the comments. I'm afraid to say I don't see um, the comments from Facebook coming through my live stream here, but I do look at them after the lesson and reply to any questions that are there. The meager entry forced the competition to be cancelled. The meaning of this sentence is irrelevant. So we're looking through. Them. Ah, that's our word, isn't it? That's a word that goes across what have I not done? I have not looked at the clue, and that's essential. And them is not a colour, okay? And now we're looking across like this. Ag agree? Ah, agree, not a colour. Green, that's a colour, so that's our answer, okay? So I'm looking at each gap steadily, looking at all the things that go across it, and waiting until I find a colour. When Paul fell ill, he became lightheaded. The meaning doesn't matter. What matters is this animal. Okay, hen, that's an animal, that must be our answer. No, because it does not overlap the end of one word and the beginning of the next. It's completely within one word. So although that's an animal, although it's in this sentence, it isn't the answer. Hemp, no, enp, no, no, nothing here. Paul, all flu, fell. So I'm just trying out all the options across each of these really quickly. Felly, eli, luli, luli, ilhel, no, hebek, ebek, no, ekamel, camel. Camel, an animal that overlaps one word and the next, and we write it out carefully here. Do not forget to do this. That is what is marked. They're not marking this. The instructions make clear that this is what they are marking. So make sure your answer is in the box. Okay, we're not even reading the sentence now. We know that's irrelevant. Tree. Okay, speak. Beak, beak, beach, beach, beach. That's a tree, that's a kind of tree. Again, look out for traps. They might easily decide, if they were nasty, to put somewhere else beach with an A, which of course is somewhere you go and sun, sun, sunbathe and get your fantastic tans, but it is not the spelling for a kind of tree. Um, okay, onwards. Ah, someone says because. Uh, no. Not because, first of all, I don't see it, and secondly, not a tree. A marmoset is a type of little monkey. Hidden word is a fruit. Okay. Amam, ama, no, no, no. Ozet setis setis is a, is a sa. A type, yeah. Payoff, no. Offlit, hmm, nothing yet. Telem, telem, lem, limo, lemon. Now, I know you can just look up the answers. They do actually give the answers on their website, just no, no explanation, but just the answers. Um, so you might say, why am I taking time to show you? It's because I'm trying to show you the method, that I've got a really clear system here. What I'm not doing, and this is really important, I'm not just looking at the sentence and seeing whether I can see it. Because if I do see it quickly, that's great. But what happens if I don't see it quickly and I just keep staring at this sentence going, where's the answer, where's the answer, where's the answer? Instead, I've got a system. I look at each gap, 
I try things out across each gap, I check whether it's a fruit, and that way, unless they've chosen some extraordinary kind of exotic fruit that I've never heard of, I will find the answer. So, you know, this particular question type might well not turn up in the exam you're doing, even if you're sitting for Manchester Grammar School. They might set something different, they change it up each year. But the point is, I've seen the parameters of the question, I've seen what's required, and so I've developed a system that allows me to reliably find the answers. And don't tell me I'm splitting an infin infinitive, that is not an error in English, whatever some old fuddy-duddy um, teacher might say. Uh, hidden word is a sport. Come on, work, there we are. Sarah rag rag no, gavea va no, ashrua rug rugby. Named, of course, after rugby school, where the sport was invented. Um, onwards. So we got a different kind of task now. So we step back and we read the instructions. Various forms of punctuation and grammar, okay? In each question there are four possible alternatives, A, B, C and D, in other words it's a multiple choice question. Uh, choose the letter which you think answers the question best, then write your choice of letter in the box provided. Okay, do not forget to write your letter in the box. If the answer is... but no, we'll come to that. Uh, okay. Which of the following sentences should end with a question mark? In other words, we are looking for a question. Okay, direct question. She wondered whether or not it was snowing. She is wondering it. She is to herself, she is questioning herself about this. Is it snowing or not? But this sentence is a statement. It's just telling us that she was wondering this. It isn't a question. It should not have a question mark at the end. If you wanted to put a question mark after that, then you need to look into your look into the rules for question marks a little more. It has been an unusually mild winter. No, just a statement. Have any storms been forecast for this week? Question. Clearly a question. So clearly a question that I don't even need to look at D because there's only one that can be right. If I found one that's clearly a question, then I can accept it, okay? It's not like some kind of comprehension question where there might be a better answer. If you found the answer, then you found it, okay? And notice that I've written the letter in the box because that is how I get the mark. How many adverbs are there in the following sentence? Oh, I hate this business. Okay. Recently. Okay, it's a Lee word. It's clearly an adverb of time telling us when something happened. And the Lee is, is a nice reminder, even though this is actually... Well, never mind. It just clearly is an adverb. I've been training... Let's go for the obvious ones first. Furiously. Adverb. Okay. I've. That's I have. What is this? I, pronoun, have... Okay, verb, been, verb, training, verb. So these are all to do with, these are all rel rel relevant to verbs. None of them is describing a verb. I'm not going to go into the detail of what every part there is, but they're not adverbs. Training furiously for my very first race. Now, very here, it's modifying the adjective first. It's telling us how first this is. It's your very first race. And a word like that that modifies an adjective is also an adverb. And that's a slightly more subtle rule of grammar, okay? So there are, in fact, three adverbs here. First is an adjective, it describes the race, and race is a noun, it's a race. So the answer is D, three. Now, be very careful here. The answer is three. Do not write three. You have to write down the letter and write the letter in the box provided. And the letter is D. Be very careful with that. When you're under time pressure, that would be a very, very easy mistake to make. Okay? Um, right. On to the next. Which of the following sentences is punctuated correctly? So let's look for errors and rule out all the ones that are incorrect. For this one, you do need to check all of them because you might find one that looks correct but have missed something in it. So we need to check we need to find three that are wrong, and then the other one should be the answer. Rahul, did you see the eclipse? asked Laura. What's this name doing? Hang on, she must have said, Rahul, did you see the eclipse? So this should be in the quotation marks. Quotation marks shouldn't be here. So this one is wrong. It was only partial in the southeast, muttered Mike. Okay, we got a comma at the end. Southeast, compass direction, hyphenated, fine. Muttered Mike, full stop at the end. That looks good to me, quite possibly. It doesn't matter if I circle the wrong one because what's being marked is this. So I think this is probably the answer um, and I'm circling it, but I have to check the others. But the best for you was over in Sunderland, 
Aaron added. This looks right, doesn't it? It's got capital letters, it's got comma after the quotation. A real pedant, someone who's really, really, really picky about things to the point of almost making up their own rules, might say that comma should be inside the quotation mark. So there is that little thing there, which arguably, arguably makes it incorrect. Certainly B looks like a better bet than this. So if I have to choose between B and C, I choose B, and therefore I'm going to say that C is wrong, even though it's a little bit marginal. It's still an exciting rare spectacle, Suzette argued. Hmm. Right, I said that these were really well set papers. Um, and this is an example of where they're being very, very, very subtle. So on the face of things we'd say, look, clearly what she says is this. And the quotation mark shouldn't be here. But then you might say, hang on, but what happens if all this is being repeated to somebody else? So I go to my friend, um, I go to my friend Simon, and I say, it's still an exciting rare spectacle, Suzette argued. So what happens if I've said all of this? Shouldn't all of it be in quotation marks? Yes, that would be fine. So I could have the quotation mark at the end, but then what Suzette says would have to be in its own quotation marks, because even if the whole thing is something that I say, that's still a quote from Suzette. So even if you tweak this around in your head, it's still not right. B is the answer. Now, of course, you won't spend that amount of time on it in the test. And if you need to, it would be one to skip and come back to later, as the instructions at the beginning suggest. Let's make it be a little bit clearer, um, a little bit chubbier. Um, um, but uh, chubbier would be the correct word in English. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I just want to show you the thought process in detail if you need that explained. If any of this punctuation that I've just gone through is unclear, you need to research those particular points. There's some really good websites out there. Uh, Grammarly is an example of a, uh, we've got a good blog on grammar going through all these things. Um, sometimes talk slightly to the American, but they normally explain where there's a British English difference. There are lots of other grammar websites out there. If you're not quite clear about how to punctuate speech, then you need to spend some time researching it, doing a few exercises. You'll find them readily online and bring yourself up to speed. How many words in the following sentence should start with a capital letter? First letter of the sentence should be a capital. Monday, name of a day of the week, should be a capital. Nigel is a name, should be a capital. Booked his summer holiday to Sri Lanka. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's C, C. Okay, we do not write five, we write C because you have to write the letter, careful. Um, keep concentrating on the rules. Now, some people may fall into the trap of thinking, oops, that summer should be capitalized. It's, there's little, there's little rhyme or reason to this, um, but summer, the seasons of the year are not capitalized, even though the days of the weeks and the names of the months are. Now, the kind of origin behind that, I think, is that the days of the week and the months of the year are um, generally, mostly, uh, named after, mm, but no, they're not always really. Some of them are named after people. The days of the weeks are, they're mostly, they're almost all named after um, gods, one way or another. Um, or you've got a day like Monday, Moon Day, but you know. Um, but like Thursday, Thor's Day, for example, lots of, uh, Friday, uh, free is, yeah, um, what, how do you say, phrase day, I suppose. Um, so there are various names in there. So that helps to explain why, but really it ult ultimately it's a pretty arbitrary rule. It just happens that seasons aren't capitalized. Question 10, how are we doing for time? We're doing quite well, we'll get through this, good. How many prepositions are there in the following sentence? Ooh, oof, prepositions, what are prepositions? They're things telling us how things relate to each other, generally in space. They're position words, in other words. Although toys and games are kept under the table, behind the sofa, sports equipment belongs in the cupboard, by the door. Under, behind, in, by, that's four of them, so the answer's D. Now this is very tricky, and you might think, is although a preposition? Or you might think, um, is, um, well, I suppose although is the most one most likely to confuse you. But then you'd have five, and there isn't an option for five. We only go up to four. So even if you end up finding too many, you're still likely to end up choosing option D and recognizing that you've just got a little bit confused. Um, okay, so 
I'm trying to show you that even with me explaining everything, I can still move through at a fair lick. Um, and you, when you're doing this yourself, when you don't actually need to explain all the choices that you're making, if you have good systems for working through, such as I'm using, then um, you're going to do well. Now, if you just see a word like prepositions and you think, I do not have a clue what this means, well, if you see it now, then that's an indication you should be researching your parts of speech and grammar and learning them, okay? Your basic parts of speech. Um, but if you're in an exam and that happens, this would be an example of a question that you'd skip and come back to later and then try and work out your best guesstimate, shall we say, um, because you've got no time to lose to faff around. Okay, now we're on to the comprehension. Read the whole passage carefully and then answer the questions that follow by writing the letter A, B, C or D in the appropriate answer space. Might have seen that before. The passage is reprinted on page six to help you when you're working on the questions on page seven. In other words, it's kind of a booklet, it's a booklet and they make sure there's always a passage opposite you whenever you're working on the questions, which is very nice of them. Um, we don't need to worry about that because I've got it pulled up here. Now the poem is actually relatively long. It's very, very important, really important, that however rushed you might be, you take the time to read the whole poem. Yes, quickly, but to read the whole thing so you know what's going on before you start answering the questions. Otherwise, you will find some of these quite difficult. Now, I'm going to assume that you've already read it. If you haven't read it, and especially if you're not watching this live, then pause the video here, download the worksheet, read the poem properly, and then come back to join me for what I'm doing. Ideally, you'll have a go at the questions first. I always encourage people to print out the worksheet before the lesson and have a go. Uh, that's by far the best way to learn from these things. Okay. As I say, I'm going to assume, these are the same instructions you've already had, I'm going to assume that you've already read the poem um, as I go through these. I'm not going to read through it all for you now because that wouldn't be a good use of time in this lesson because you've got really important things to do like dinner and homework and um, zobbing on computer games. Do you still say zobbing or is that just slang from when I was at school? I don't know. Okay, where is this poem set? On a farm in Wales. I can tell you there's no mention of Wales in the poem. So it could be, but there is no evidence for it. In a meadow by an apple orchard, on moorland next to cherry trees, beside a lake beneath some trees. Okay, um, I can tell you there's no mention of a lake. I'm just making life easy for you here because if you've read the poem, you also will find it quite easy to eliminate those two. Now, now we're gonna have a look at the text a bit because both of these next two are likely to be more tempting. So we've got a description, thistle and dam, thistle and Damel and Doc grew there, and a bush in the corner of May. On the orchard wall I used to sprawl. So that's a strong hint, but then an orchard could contain cherry trees, so it could be either. In the blazing heat of the day, okay? And nobody there my loan to share but Nicholas Nye, okay? We have description of a lame leg and old, more than a score of donkey's years. So it could be about a donkey, or it could be comparing a person to a donkey. He had since, since he was foaled, okay, clue there. He munched the thistles purple and spike, was not a stupid sign, turn his head and if so, he munches the thistles, he was foaled. You might be guessing what kind of animal this is. He has donkey's ears, hmm. Um, so he's munching all these things, but he could be munching in a meadow or maybe on some moorland. Um, along, alone with his shadow, he drows in the, ah, I've cut this off a bit soon, in the meadow. So there we have it. And at that point, we do have our answer. Um, I suppose the meadow could be on a moor, but we're clearly told there is an orchard uh, where, the, uh, where the narrator sits and watches this donkey, Nicholas Nye, so, um, and he is in a meadow. So we have clear evidence for B, and so that's what we're going to choose. And we have to write that in the answer space. I almost forgot, don't forget yourself. Sorry, my handwriting here, um, what can I say? Who is Nicholas Nye? We've covered this already. Um, and this is why you should read the poem first, of course, so you know these basic things. If you've read it properly, it'll be clear we're talking about a donkey. He munches on thistles. He's more than a score of donkey's years old. Um, he's lame of leg and old. So he's not a man, not a statue. Um, you might wonder whether the horse is being described in terms of donkey's years and a horse has a foal, um, and you can see fold down here, but you know, you might imagine that so does a donkey. Um, but also, crucially, he is lame of a leg. Oops, sorry, I wasn't trying to cross that out. That's an underline, honestly. So tall and powerful, 
powerful? No. It's an old grey donkey. What is meant by the words, nobody there my loan to share in line seven? Let's have a look at it. Uh, the line numbers are off to the side here. Um, sorry, you can't even see them on the screen there. Um, but just trust me that they're there. Um, but we're talking about nobody there my loan to share. So you can see that uh, here towards the end of the first verse. And nobody there my loan to share. Let's go back a little bit. Um, I used to sprawl on the orchard wall when it was hot, half asleep and half awake with the birds twittering by, and nobody there my loan to share but Nicholas and I. Okay. Hmm. There was no one around to share the narrator's money troubles. Well, loan, so someone lends you money. Maybe you struggle to pay it back. That would be a loan. It's spelled differently, L-O-A-N. You probably know that. But maybe this is an old-fashioned spelling. There was no one around to share the narrator's apples. Would apples be loan? Well, that would be such an obscure thing. Um, I don't think you can really go with that. There was no one there to share the narrator's loneliness. Ah, loan. My loan to share. That sounds really likely. No one here to hear the narrator's stories. Well, I mean, stories doesn't sound like loan at all. And just an old word that nobody uses that has some really obscure meaning and there's no context to suggest it's about stories. A and C are the likely ones. So is this loan, as in a sum of money that you struggle to pay back? Or is this, and if you've got a big loan at the moment, you're um, quivering in your boots as interest rates um, start to spike. Um, anyway. No one around share the narrator's money troubles. There's no one there to share the narrator's loneliness. Loan, loan, loan. Well, if I just stick an A, can I do this, on the beginning, then we got alone. That really sounds like it. And he's talking about how he's there by himself and there's nobody else there apart from the donkey. So alone would make sense. So yes, it could be some old spelling of loan, a money loan, but there's nothing else in the poem to suggest that. And he clearly is alone, on the other hand. So the idea there's no one there to share his loneliness seems much, much more plausible. So even when you can't be sure of the answer, and I think here it's fair to say you can't be 100% sure, um, you can be strongly steered by logic towards what happens to be the right answer here. Um, okay. 14, what do you think the word gumption means in line 21? If you know the word, because this is also a word that's still used in modern English, then this is relatively easy. But let's imagine that you don't. So line 21, I can tell you it's down here. Um, and you can find the word anyway. A wonderful gumption was under his skin. Alone with the shadow, he drows in the meadow. Sorry, that's a bit chopped off. Lazily swinging his tail. At break of day, he used to bray. Not much too hearty in hail, okay? But a wonderful gumption was under his skin and a clean, calm light in his eye. And once in a while, he'd smile with Nicholas and I. Disease. A wonderful disease was under his skin. Unlikely. A wonderful skeleton was under his skin. Bit of a weird thing to say. A wonderful anger was under his skin. I mean, that might make sense. He's fired with anger. But look at the next line. And a clean, calm light in his eye. No. A wonderful spirit was under his skin. Well, literally, if you imagine like, under his skin all around, doesn't really make sense. But if you take under his skin to mean, you know, he's got this old donkey, sanky skin, but inside him, he's still got a great spirit. And there's lots of that in the poem and particularly if you imagine a wonderful he had a wonderful spirit and a clean calm light in his eye and sometimes he'd smile this old donkey well however you imagine that happening ah uh, um yes that's fine i thought i hadn't filled in the answer but that is this one ignore me um don't ignore me pay close attention so is skeleton or spirit more likely clearly spirit he had a wonderful spirit in himself even though his skin was all old, old and tattered um yeah that really makes sense Line 31 to 32 describes something better than words passing between the narrator and Nicholas Nye. What do you think this is? Let's have a glance. So 31 to 32. Okay. Um, ah, sorry, this is a bit chopped off. Can I show it a bit better? That's me at the end. Sorry about that. And we're looking at these lines here. Um, something much better than words between me and Nicholas Nye. Okay. Let's just look back at this verse quickly. He seemed to be smiling at me, he would, from the bush in the corner of May. 
Bony and ownerless, widowed and worn, noble need, lonely and grey. So that's all rather sad. And over the grass would seem to pass, neath the deep dark blue of the sky, neath must be beneath. Something much, um, over the grass would seem to pass, neath the deep dark blue of the sky, something much better than words between me and Nicholas Nye. So he seemed to be smiling, even though he looks so sad and he's alone and old and, you know, decrepit. But he's smiling. And across the meadow to the narrator on his orchard wall, something much better than words would pass. OK. Loving glances from eye to eye. It could be that. Laughter and merriment of a joke shared. Nah. Seemed to be smiling despite his sadness. That's not laughter and merriment. A connection between two similar characters. They're both alone. They've both got their sadnesses because we've seen how the narrator is um, has nobody to share his loan. And we said that was loneliness. Nobody to share his loneliness. And Nicholas Nye is the same. And they share something. So C seems really likely. Some sugared donut? No. Loving glances or... A connection between two people who are similar. A is maybe in a sense true, I suppose, if friendship is a kind of love, which of course it is, but C seems to describe this better. And don't forget something I say all the time in my multiple choice videos, your job is to choose the best answer. There might be more than one possible answer, but you need to choose the best one. The best thing for me right now is a sip of coffee. All this talking, all this thinking. Um, Okay, onwards. Yathath, behave yourself. Right. Question 16. We've only got five to go, folks. We're only going up to question 20 in today's lesson, and we're racing through. So hopefully we'll actually be able to get away a little bit early, or earlier than usual, um, because I do tend to ramble on. Aha! We've got some um, language questions. OK, so we are back to where we were before when we were talking about grammar and so on, but in the context of this poem. A punctuation mark is used in line 28 to make the compound adjective noble need. What is it called? Well, I don't think we really need to look at the poem, but in case you're curious, it's here. The reason I say we don't need to look at the poem, it's got nothing to do with the meaning, it's got nothing to do with what's around these words. We're just looking at the punctuation mark itself um, to make the compound adjective. Well, let's look at the context a bit. Um, seems to be smart. He would from the bush in the corner of May. Bony and endless, widowed and worn. Noble need, lonely and grey. So these are all things describing him. Adjectives, lonely, grey, bony, ownless, widowed, worn. Noble need, okay? He isn't noble. That wouldn't make sense. That's a very noble donkey. What? No, doesn't mean anything. But noble need together is an adjective. It's an adjective formed of two words, okay? If he said he was need, that wouldn't really make sense either. Of course he's got knees, um, otherwise he'd be walking around like this. Um, so um, yeah, noble need together. His knees are knobbly, right? Um, anyway, the punctuation mark that joins these together. I think you're going to be pretty easily reduced down to C and D for what it's worth. And ampersand is, um, no it isn't, that's nonsense. I'm talking absolute nonsense, So sorry. Ampersand is the, the and symbol, isn't it? Ah! Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, ah! Uh, not an at, an and symbol. Uh, anyway, um, I love, by the way, not an ampersand is one of these things, isn't it? But, uh, wow, it's badly done. Uh, I love what uh, one word for this in German, by the way, is um, Affenschwanz, a monkey's tail, which I think is a beautiful description of that. If you imagine the tail curling over the back of the monkey, it's a word I really like. Unfortunately, nobody really uses it. They just say at, which is rather sad. Anyway, uh, back to English. Um, is it a hyphen or a dash? Now this, my friends, you just have to know. A dash, can we find an example in the poem? Yes, we can. A dash would be this. So a dash has a space on either side of it, and it's a kind of pause which sort of implies a kind of waiting for what comes next. At break of day, he used to bray. Not too much hearty inhale. Okay, so it's a kind of take a pause, but wait for the next idea. That's what a dash is. 
whereas a hyphen is a joining symbol that pulls two things together. So this is a hyphen. If you don't know this, you really have nothing to do apart from guess between A and B. But it's something you ought to know. Having said that, it's really tough for 11 plus. I mean, many people wouldn't know this, but they can know to cross out C and D, your ampersand, can I do this better? I always end up doing something that looks like sort of either a, you know, messed up eight or a kind of treble clef, but anyway, um, and a bracket, clearly not those. Right, line 13, which word is the noun? He munched thistles purple. Now, it's almost certainly going to be thistles, isn't it? because that's almost, in almost any context you can think of going to be a noun. But we should still, still, still check. Line 13, he munched the thistles purple and spiked. He, no, as a pronoun, um, because it replaces a noun. So if you said um, Nicholas munched the thistles, then that would be a noun, a proper noun, Nicholas. But he replaces the word Nicholas. It is for, pro, a noun, so it's a pronoun. He munched, clearly a verb, it's what he was doing, Purple, clearly an adjective, it describes the thistles. Thistles is the noun. You could get that one pretty much just by looking at these, but do check the text in case, case there's a trick. Um, uh, what are thistles? They are the spiky things that grow in um, unkempt fields or in your lawn if you don't keep it well mown. Well mown? Well mown. Um, uh, yeah, Nestle, nettles sting you, thistles spike you. Line three gives an example, only three left. Give three gives an example of rhyme used by the poet connecting the words wall and sprawl. What is this type of rhyme called? Line three. Okay. Uh, where are we? Yeah. On the orchard wall, I used to sprawl. Wall and sprawl. Okay. What can we notice about this rhyme? Before we get into the options, let's just think about it a sec. This is not a rhyme at the end of lines, which is the kind you're used to seeing. So for example, day and may, these are at the ends of lines. These are within a line, okay? Is it a true rhyme or not? So for this, you need to think about the sounds of the words because English spelling is, is irregular. So wall, sprawl, all, all. Yeah, it's the same sound, so it's a true rhyme. Okay, now we go back into the options. What is this type of rhyme called? Rhyming couplets. Right. Tricky, but rhyming couplets, you're looking at things at the ends of lines for a start. Okay? End line rhyme, it clearly isn't because one of them is not at the end of the rhyme. Half rhyme or internal rhyme. I mean, this is so difficult. If you don't know these things, it's so, so, so difficult. Um, but, but, good comprehension, good multiple choice technique means eliminating the things that you know aren't right so A and B, and then if worse comes to the worst, guessing between what's left over. Because that's a one in two guess, which is a much better chance than a one in four guess, and you don't need to have good 11 plus maths to realize that. So always eliminate, even if you aren't sure, because if you're going to guess, at least guess between the ones that are still possible. Right, half rhyme or internal rhyme. So um, I'm just gonna to have to tell you now what these mean in case you don't know. Um, but no, first of all, hang on, slow down, Robert, slow down. If I didn't know which one it was, how might I guess? Hmm. We've already said that these words rhyme fully. All and all. So even if you don't know what a half rhyme is, it doesn't really make sense to say these half rhyme because they completely rhyme. Internal rhyme. Well, internal means inside something. And you can see looking at the text here, that there we are, that these are within the same line and one of them isn't even at the end of the line. So even if you don't know what an internal rhyme is, that would be a sensible guess. It makes more sense. Okay, and that is indeed what an internal rhyme is. It's rhyme within a line. Half rhyme is where the last sort of consonant sound of a word matches, but the rest doesn't. Um, so, um, for example, um, um, want and pant are half rhymes because one is ont and one is ant. So the sound is not quite the same, but they both have the t, 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 end. Yeah, you've got the t ending, want and pant. So want and pant will be a half rhyme. These are an internal rhyme. But I think you can guess that just by thinking about what about the words half 
and internal, even if you didn't know that. 19. Right, this is a question I do not like. Um, most of these questions I think are great. This one I think is, is not so great. The poet produces sound effects by using words the same starting sound, such as hearty and hail and widowed and warm. What is the correct spelling of this technique? I mean, they could have just said, what is the correct spelling? Because do they even need to explain it? Anyway, is it alliteration, 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 alliteration? Okay. You either know it or you don't. It's B. The reason I don't like this question is because there are lots of very, very able people who um, have spelling difficulties, uh, specifically if they're dyslexic. Um, and I just think actively taking a mark away from someone who might be dyslexic is just a pointless way of ruling out potential candidates who might be great. Um, and I think it's a slightly different game from assessing smelling, spelling as a whole in a um, bit of creative writing, for example. But anyway, the question is here and they want you to be able to spell it. It's one of the very common techniques that you're likely to encounter, um, alliteration. So, you know, make sure that you've learnt these key terms and that you do know how to spell them. Last one we're going to look at today. There are, of course, more questions here. It goes up to question 40, but we are looking at questions 1 to 20 today, and I'm going to come back to the others in another lesson. Um, not next week, because I'm on holiday, not the week after, because we're doing something else, but possibly the week after that, and certainly within the next few weeks, we'll do the rest of this paper. How do you think the narrator feels towards Nicholas and I by the end of the poem? Okay. Interesting. So, you have already read the poem, of course, if you're doing the exam. By the end, let's just look at the end again. But dusk would come in the apple boughs. Yes, so there's a connection between them. Something much better than words passed between him and Nicholas and I. Dusk would come in the apple boughs. The green of the glowworm shine. The birds in nest would crouch to rest. And home I'd trudge to mine, to my home. And there in the moonlight dark would you, asking not wherefore or why, would brood like a ghost. And still as a post, old Nicholas Nye. So he'd just stand there brooding in the night. Okay. Beautiful. Really beautiful this. Um, okay. How does he feel? He's grown bored of him. Mm, I mean, he stays there until dusk comes in. So he stays as late as he can, really, uh, without, you know, um, whoever's at home saying, where have you been? What have you been doing? Um, and he, even when he's home, seems to have this image of Nicholas Nye standing there in the field, thinking about him brooding. None of this smacks of boredom. It sounds like deep affection to me. The narrator feels sorry for him and pities him. Maybe. But Nicholas doesn't ask wherefore or why, he just stands there brooding. He might feel sorry for him. Most of the feeling sorry for him stuff is kind of here when he's bony and ownerless, widowed and warm, not only lonely and grey. So he does feel sorry for him. But does that describe the overall mood as we get towards the end? I'm not sure it really captures what's in the, you know, the last few lines of the poem. So it's possible, but I'm looking for a better option. The narrator adores him and is eager to return the next day. I think he does adore him. And he may well be eager to return the next day. But is there actually any evidence for this, that the narrator is eager to return? I'm not convinced. I don't see that evidence here. We might well guess that the narrator, out in his affection for Nicholas and I, is eager to return. But we would be guessing. B and C are both possibly right. They are both in many ways right. Which one's better? I'm really not sure. And at this point, I'm really hoping that D is a better option, because otherwise I'm not sure how I'm going to choose between B and C. The narrator feels both sympathy and admiration for his quiet strength. Sympathy, yes. He talks about how he's bony and endless, whittled and worn, noble, need, lonely and grey. Um, you know, he clearly pities him. Admiration for his quiet strength, does it say that? Not explicitly, but he does comment on how Nicholas stands there in the moonlight asking not wherefore or why, but just stays there thinking, still, through the night. That to me does suggest admiration. And so I think D 
is a much better answer than B or C. Even though you could argue for B or C, you would be wrong to argue that either is better than D. And remember, another thing that I say all the time in my multiple choice videos, you often have to choose the best answer, not the right answer, because often there'll be more than one potentially correct response, but the mark only goes for choosing the best one. And that's what we have to do here, okay? Option D. And there we have it. That's what we are going to, that's what we were going to look at today. It's what we have looked at today. Uh, objective achieved. And we're going to come back and look at the other ones in a future lesson. Okay, I'm feeling exhausted after that, so I'm not going to hang around too long. But let's take a little break for the... So, um, I was... I tend to repeat a lot of the same tips actually over time because I know people haven't seen all my videos and they're useful, but this is one that I haven't given before, so brace yourselves. And I thought a tip for some creative writing. Um, so um, I just wanted to raise a thought. You get advice from everywhere about your writing, how to make it better, how to make it more interesting, um, how to impress the examiner. Um, but another thing to think about is what you would enjoy reading. And I just put one to put one specific thought in your mind. You are, of course, all readers, I hope. And as you read, there will be times when you're going along like this. And there'll be times when you're like this and you're absorbed and fascinated by what you're reading and you're really looking forward to finding out what happens next. Or you're finding that you really care about the character and really mind what happens to them. When those moments come along, don't just flip through them, but take a moment to think, why? What is it at this moment that's involving me? What is making me feel passionate about what I'm reading? How is the writer doing it? And how can I incorporate some of those things in my own writing? Not everything that excites you in a book you're reading will be an appropriate thing to include. So for example, if there's loads of dramatic action, that probably isn't a good thing to include in your 11 plus story because then it'll just be a list of events. Um, but if you're really excited by um, by how something is described that really, in a way that really takes you into it, for example, by the way that a character really seems to pop out at you like a real person. Take the time to think why and think how you could do something similar yourself. And that's how you'll become a much better writer. Okay, and that is my tip for today. Right, let's see if we've got any questions coming in at this point. Um, there are often lots of questions. Uh, I know lots of people are doing exams. If your questions are along the lines of how do I prepare for this particular school? Um, how do I, what do I do on the day of the exam? I've dealt with loads of those questions in recent videos. So maybe look back to my question and answer sessions in some recent live lessons and you'll find a lot on those. But what other things coming in? Um, can my cat Milky get a shout out? Hey Milky, yes, lovely to have you there. A Turkish Vandeski. I have no idea what a Turkish Vandeski looks like, but I will Google it after this. Turkish Vandeski sounds fascinating. Um, um, okay. Um, where are you on holiday? That is, of course, a mystery because, of course, if I said where I was going on holiday, I know that all my Easy 11 Plus fans would turn up with their long lens cameras um, capturing me as I bask on the beach in my Speedos and... Um, don't worry, that's a horrible image for you. I don't have speedos. Uh, and frankly, in October, I don't think I'm going to be basking on any beaches. But anyway, I have to stay away from your paparazzi long lenses. And so I couldn't possibly tell you why I'm going on holiday. Um, I'm going to Iceland. That'll put them off my, put them off my tail. I'm not going to Iceland. Um, okay. Um, Strawberry Cloud says, so boring poems suck. You're missing out, is all I can say. Um... Okay, lots of questions, shout out. Are there any actual questions? Um, ah, a sensible question from Carol Knowles. Good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Um, should students in year five do tests very often? And how often do you think? Um, what other free resources are there in channels for 11 plus? Whoa, that's a greedy uh, attempt to ask me lots of questions, but why not? You won't get answers if you don't try. Um, okay, should you do tests very often in year five? Um, if you mean time tests where they're really like an exam, no. Uh, because the more time you're practicing the feeling of being in an exam, the less time you're spending actually working on your skills and technique. 
If you mean should you and year five be working through things that look like real tests often, then yes, I think so. But go through them slowly and carefully. When you come to something that's difficult, stop and work out why it's difficult, work out which skills you need to develop, and then step out and work on those skills um, by practicing writing the question in different ways, by looking at example answers and, and explanations of the kind that I offer in my resources. Look in the links in the video description for lots of free resources for me where you can see what I mean, um, because I always put full example answers and everything and explain what I'm doing a bit like in this video, so perhaps more clearly, because I'm not making it up as I go along. Um, so use tests to practice, but use them intelligently and don't just race through them like everything's an exam. What other free resources are there? Um, well, for example, loads of schools put free past papers on their websites. So that's a good place to look. Um, there are lots of things out there. Google is your friend. Um, but have a look at the free resources linked below this video for some stuff that you can get straight away. Channels for 11 plus, hmm, I don't know what the best channels are. I have to be honest, I spend so much time working on my own channel, I don't spend as much time as I should looking at other people's channels. Uh, and give a shout out to uh, Lesson Aid, uh, who does some great stuff. Um, but uh, I'm not really certain, to be honest. Sorry about that. It's not because I don't want to recommend other people's channels. I, I want people to find lots of channels and not just mine, but I don't know what's best out there. Um, um, but um, but I don't I don't give shout outs that people ask for for themselves because otherwise that's all people would ask for. Uh, cat, um, Ray, Ray Kaza, Ray Kvatsa, I don't know. The cat anyway gets a shout out definitely. Um, will we get a short lesson next week when you're on holiday? No, it's a holiday for you as well. Uh, but you can look back at my enormous list of videos from the past and look watch some videos that you haven't seen before if you want. If you look in the video description, there's a link to a file called Video List which is a list of all my videos. Who would have thought? Um, what else have we got here? Sorry if I missed some. Um, shout out to the cat, Teddy. Um, do, 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 do. Should I get more tuition if it's useful? If you find a really good tutor, otherwise don't waste your money on it. Um, um, <laughs> it's not really a question I can answer, it depends. Hum, hum, hum. Robert, you're the best. Thank you, Debbie, you are the best as well. We're both the best. Um, <laughs> can I get a shout out for my axolotl ocean? Brilliant, um, I don't believe you. Um, no, why don't I believe you? Um, I think it's a creative way to get a shout out, but you might have an axolotl called ocean. Um, and if you do, axolotls are wonderful, fascinating things. They look a little bit like me, if you're wondering what they look like. Um, and uh, yeah, ocean, shout out for you. Okay, okay, okay. Hamster Rocky, yes, blah, blah, blah. Can you make a lesson of concluding a story? Have I done that? I might have covered that. If not, I should. Good idea. I've actually done so many videos, I've forgotten whether I've covered that or not, but I should cover it. Um, however, I should say in 11 Plus Lifeline, which is my big 11 Plus service that you can sign up to, look at the links in the video description, there is um, at least one worksheet specifically on concluding a story. So that's one place to look. Um, I've certainly got videos on continuing a story. Um, 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 can you give me any words of advice? Yes. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm about to finish because I'm just exhausted. I'm really flagging here. I'm so tired. Um, I think it was a really intense paper. Can I get, okay, okay, okay. Lots of pet shout outs. I don't believe lots of them. Robert, are you married? The clue is there. Um, 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 uh, do, do, do you play Brawl Stars? No, I have no idea what that is. Should I? Um, why is it good to pass the 11 plus? That is a very philosophical question. Um, if there's a particular school that you want, really want to go to that um, requires an 11 plus, a pass, the pass of an 11 plus exam, then it would be good to pass it to go to that school. In the abstract, there's nothing particularly good about it. It's a way to achieve something that you want to achieve. What is good always is to prepare for the 11 plus well, because this is where you take all the skills that you learned, uh, that you've learned so far, you bring them all together, you learn how to combine them, 
and then you prepare yourself to head into secondary school with a really good stock of knowledge behind you. So whether it's good to pass the 11 plus depends on what your particular goals for the future are. But the one thing that's always worthwhile is to prepare really well for the 11 plus, whether or not you pass it, whether or not you even sit it, to be honest. Um, you know, if everyone did this preparation, it'd be a real benefit. Often these exams are better, more useful exams than the SATs that you also sit at primary school. Um, Yathath, I'm giving you a shout out here for a very nice comment. Hello Robert, it's been almost four weeks into my new secondary school and I am really enjoying it. Folks, if you're wondering why you want to pass the 11 plus, that perhaps is the answer. So I think it makes a lot of sense for Yathath to have the last word there. Right, we're going to wrap things up in a second. It's been fantastic to have you. Don't disappear. Why not stay around and watch some more videos on the channel, like the one that's going to pop up here at some stage if you're re-watching this. Um, Anyway, fantastic to have you. I'll be looking at the rest of this paper in a future week. Um, if you are watching this on, let's check I've got the date right, the 27th of September 2022. So this is only for you if you're watching it live. Um, next week, which is the, quickly pulls up his calendar in a panic, the 4th of October. There is no live lesson because I'm on holiday. Yes, finally a summer holiday in the depths of autumn. Uh, you can't imagine how much I'm looking forward to this. Um, so no lesson next week, but then I'll be back with the next live lesson on, I should know these dates already, on Tuesday the 11th of October 2022. If you're watching this in September 2023 or 2024, this is not relevant to you. If you're watching it in 2022, the next lesson is on Tuesday the 11th of October. I'll be emailing the worksheet out the next week. If you want to get my emails with worksheets, by the way, you want to go down there into the video description where there are free resources listed. There's a link for them. Sign up for the free resources and you also sneakily go onto my mailing list where you get worksheets for lessons in advance. Aha, so you can practice them several days before the lesson. I normally send them out on a Saturday morning. So you've got the whole weekend to do the worksheet and be really well prepared to get the most out of the live lesson the following Tuesday. Where's Dimitri? Is he hanging around here? If he is, I'll bring him in to say goodbye. No, he's off doing something Dimitri-esque. Um, so I'm just going to say goodbye myself. It's been fantastic to have you here. Thank you for your patience. I hope you found this useful. It was pretty intense. And I'll see you not next week, but the week after for my next Easy 11 Plus Live lesson. Of course, my lessons are normally every Tuesday evening at six o'clock. If you want more videos, you know what to do. Click the join button on the video, look at the options there and become a channel member. And then there are way more videos than are available for free on the channel. But membership is really cheap and you get a whole load more. OK, enough from me. I need to take a breather. Bye bye. Ah, oh, hard work this.